Belle and Sebastian, I don't think as people uh, fit into to normal society. Ben and Sebastian don't appear on the Chris Evans show, they don't appear on the Ozone, they don't appear on the Pepsi chart. People respond to that. But they're not merchant bankers, they're not uh, yuppies, they are art and they are pop at the same time. They're just one of the best bands for of the decade. Both on beatbox, me and Stuart. Uh, it was a music course for unemployed people. It was a training for work course. It so happened Stuart David, who plays bass, lived in the same flat. There was like seven other people. So um, kind of got introduced to him and met up with him. And he, at that time, was kind of writing songs with Stuart Murdoch. And they had been for two years before because they were on a, a, an unemployment course thing for music. story of Belle and Sebastian. Stuart, a young hopeful musician, would like to make pop records. He plays his songs to his friends at parties, accompanying himself on a small electric keyboard. He's not bad, but he could do with a really cool band behind him. Every time Stuart sees other pop groups playing at the local dance hall, he can't help thinking how marvellous it would be if it was his group up there on the stage playing his songs. I have to get a band together. It isn't long before Stuart meets a group of really cool people in the local caf and explains to them what he wants to do. Hey, I'm going to start a band. What a join. Yeah, I can play the cello. I can play the violin. Hmm, might just work. Recruiting other friends to play drums, bass guitar, keyboards and electric guitar, they soon have their very own band and call themselves Bell and Sebastian. Stuart Murdoch came up to me in the Grosvenor Calf and said uh, that he'd seen me play trumpet in uh, a university play and said that I want to play in a song. Um, I said OK and he came up to the flat and played me Dog on Wheels and I thought I was Pretty good. Stuart was recording his songs and I was recording my songs and 
we both just kind of got as many people in there that were on the course to play on them because they had a recording studio in there. This is uh, the, the studio. Um, every year at Stowe, we uh, select a band. Uh, the HNC class virtually becomes a massive A&R department and each year we get about 100 to 150 tapes in and three years ago, what did we get? We got Bell and Sebastian. My brother had confessed he was gay it took the heat off me for a while Everything is going very well for Bell and Sebastian especially when they get the chance to record their songs as part of a music production course at the local college. They're recording their first LP. Sounds great! Got married in a rush To save a kid from being deported Now she's in love As soon as I heard the song, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, everyone I played it to, no matter what age they were, it, their ears pricked up, and you can't ignore that. Um, uh, so it was obvious that this guy had an enormous talent. Uh, and I don't usually go for lyrics very much, but I thought these, these were some of the best lyrics I'd ever heard. Uh, and certainly the best lyrics I'd heard for an awful long time. The priest in the book had a photographic memory for all he had heard. He took all of my friends. I was in a record shop and I saw the sleeve and I just thought the sleeve was nice. And I remember asking a man in the shop, you know, what are they like? And he's actually quite rude about them. But what he said uh, actually made me want to buy the record, despite this, and I did, and I got it home, and I put it on. And, you know, it was just something that, that you know, it was just, it was just really good. Luckily, Bell and Sebastian's LP is heard by a top radio disc jockey. He listens to it on his expensive hi-fi system in his luxurious bachelor pad, which he shares with his friend. Hey, I tell you what, this record is an absolute corker. We'll have to get these lads on the show. What do you reckon, lad? Sounds like a right old load of tosh to me. Later. Hello, is that Stuart from Bell and Sebastian? Yeah, right. Do you fancy coming on the show or what, our kid? Before long, they're playing their songs live on national radio and being interviewed by Mark Radcliffe. Right, now then, tonight we've got live music from uh, Bell and Sebastian. So, uh, who, who are you, then? Um, Stuart Murdoch. Right, right. And who are you, then? I'm Richard. And who are you? You know who I am, I told you. It's Isabel. Isabel. Right, okay then. Uh, right, what are you going to play first then, you lot? Someone speak to me. I, I could, could be, be dreaming. dreaming. Right, okay, Bell and Sebastian. One, two, three, four, one, two. It's almost a bit like, um, ooh, you know, a bit shambling. And it could almost fall apart at any minute. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's most intriguing about them. You know, it, is so, it seems so fragile. Uh, they may not think so when they're, when they're playing. And you know, and the sessions they've done for us, um, you know, have been hugely enjoyable. But you know, I don't think anybody could pretend there aren't loads of bum notes in there and stray harmonies, because there are. You know, but again, that's part of the, the charm of it, really. <laughs> This is our 200 Troubled Teenagers. Um, we've got two jurors performing trumpet versions of their favourite Bell and Sebastian songs. We've got a xylophone and a recorder if people want to play along to their favourite Bell and Sebastian songs. We've got lots of Bell and Sebastian songs to play. There'll be lots of dancing, there are tiger milkshakes, and there's a survey so we can finally find out who is best out of Ben and Sebastian and Steps. And, uh, and hopefully there will be 200 troubled teenagers. They do seem to have the genuine empathy with the fans. In a, in a way, even though the music's entirely different, 
Um, it reminded me of kind of uh, the early days of the Happy Mondays because in the early days of the Happy Mondays, uh, the band were completely indistinguishable from the fans. You know, you would see this group of 300 people arrive at a hall and you just didn't know which four or five would be the ones to get up on the stage. You know, there was a kind of, and, and it's a bit like that with Bell and Sebastian, really. I think everyone's probably a lot older than, than people think we are because the first album came out on on that college label. It was kind of a myth grew up around that, that it was people that were on the college course. And I think... Uh, when we started doing the Mark Radcliffe sessions and stuff, everyone thought we were about 16, when, <laughs> when everyone's really about, well, certainly at least half the band are almost 30. I think there is an element of, of enigma about Bell and Sebastian. Now, whether that is, is, is deliberate or accidental, I don't really know them well enough to, uh, to say. Let's have another song. What are you going to play next? <laughs> Ever go lardy or go lame, I will drop you straight away. Well, that's a chance you're gonna take for every stupid thing you say. There are people going lonely and they'll stay only far into the year, cause you make him blink as fashionable and fashionably you'll say. All is equal in love and war And I'm sorry But I got some things to do And you pretend to read a book You'll never finish till the day That the author did Now that people have heard of Bell and Sebastian Their record sells like hotcakes in the shops Very soon, there isn't enough to meet the demand We are going to run out of these soon We put some in the shops they were sold out within days. We did mail order. We did 400 by mail order worldwide. Um, and 35 record companies and 27 publishers came up to see them at, uh, when they showcased. And, you know, that was, it was fairly spectacular, yeah. Uh, and now that it's uh, going for anywhere between 800 to 1,000 pounds, uh, on the internet, I think it's, it's borne out um, what a collector's item it is. Lots of important people in the record industry hear about Bell and Sebastian, and before they know it, they're flying to America to talk big business deals. I'm gonna make you kids rich. Well, how about it, eh? Hmm. Money can't buy you love, can it? Uh, maybe we'll think about it. Yeah, it's made the difference that I don't have to go and wash dishes and that anymore, and I can buy records and stuff. And I'm, I mean, yeah, Bell and Sebastian's what I make the majority of my living. There's not many folk in the band who'd rather go back to being on the dole while washing dishes. Rock and roll motorbikes, uh, leather-clad, lonely outsiders, uh, people with perhaps not the most stylish of glasses. Um, Bell and Sebastian, I think, speak to this rather alienated and awkward and perhaps occasionally diffident constituency, um, people who dare to look that bit different, to uh, take comfort in gathering together in a kind of air of mutual alienation. I mean, they have made a, a virtue, haven't they, out of uh, thinking you are a persecuted minority, almost. Which is very funny because they sell a lot of records. There's no way this is a secret that only you are privy to. But I think that's what a lot of fans think is the case. You know, they make it, um, you can identify with something that you think is not particularly mainstream, but it is. There's kind of two bands, really. There's the one that's um, growing up kind of out of the myths Stuart started on the album sleeves and and kind of snowballed from not doing any 
any real press together or any photographs and um, that's kind of, it's more or less a fiction that one, it's a kind of fictional idea of the band and then there's the the real one which doesn't really bear much resemblance to what people think it's like. We're definitely not, we're definitely not a fey band on the whole, I mean um, there's as much there's as much rock and roll shenanigans on tour as, as uh, any band, I think, you know. I think at first they, they kind of saw us as um, really sensitive or something like that, or, or, or at least Stuart maybe, but, you know, I, I, think, I think that comes across quite a lot, um, especially from the press as well as people, you know, they, they almost put, put that thought into their minds almost, you know, with the way they write about us. The negative part, you know, like, uh, oh yeah, twee, this, that, and the next thing, blah, 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 yeah, flowers in their back pocket, they go to bed at like nine o'clock at night, they like horlicks before they go to bed, and all this rubbish. And I think a lot of people may read that and go, hmm, is that right? <laughs> but um, it really isn't the truth as it happens. <laughs> Very soon, everybody wants to know about Bell and Sebastian, and the band get loads of media attention. Some of it unwanted. Stuart, please! Mr. Sebastian, we want to make a documentary. BBC Scotland here. Oh, come on. Let's get back to the studio. He's so shy and sensitive. We're actually up in Glasgow doing another job. We thought this was an opportune time to get some photos of Bell and Sebastian, arrange to meet them there. And the people we met that day was, uh, was Chris, the keyboard player, Stuart himself, and uh, Kira McLaverty, who's the, the cover star of uh, If You're Feeling Sinister, and a friend of Stuart's. So we met up with them and uh, sort of tried to take some photos. And the initial idea that Stuart had was to have uh, Chris heading a football in the park in, in the fading evening light, which was a, a kind of nice idea, but something that would lead to a very blurred, indistinct, and not particularly great photograph. So after that, we sort of launched into a sort of reasonably protracted dialogue, trying to come up with an idea that was uh, compatible with both the band and the, the magazine. And after a while, the idea they came up with was to have um, Chris and Kiara doing some ironing at uh, Kiara's house. And uh, but again, this wasn't as quite as simple as that, because it led to more debate with the band because one idea was to have them ironing a confederate flag but Chris I think thought there might be some kind of uh, ideological uh, faults in this and the sort of connotations of a confederate flag so that debate continued for uh, yeah, another half an hour or so I think eventually they ended up uh, with Chris um, ironing a piece of tartan and uh, Kiara watching him drinking a mug of tea and uh, this is probably about six hours later. This was the actual photo we end, ended up with of, uh, of Chris and Kiara. Kiara looking on, uh, very interested as Chris is doing the ironing here. You know, it's a nice photo. We don't really allow magazine photographers or paper photographers to come and photograph us. So basically, you could only get what we let you get. So it's almost like the Ministry of Information, you know, you're only allowed the information that the, the we're allowing you sort of thing. Bell and Sebastian are left with this uh, rather unique uh, policy on, on doing photographs and interviews. I mean, there's, I think it's got to the stage now where Stuart Murdoch isn't doing any interviews at all and the, the, the photos are doing are very uh, unconventional ones, again, never featuring Stuart. And uh, it sort of raises the issue, you know, why they're, why they're doing this particularly. I think we've still got the, the view, whether it's innocent or not, or, or naive or whatever, that that the music is the first thing and, and, and the rest of it, it's not all that bothered about. Because I think there are bands that, that put the media on top of their music almost. You know, uh, they're in the papers every week and, they're, and, and, and you know, they're in magazines every week and they're on television all the time and stuff. And it's almost like you know them for that rather than their music. I think that their relationships with the, with the media, um, I think it could well be counterproductive. Um, I think it is based on a genuine shyness and a genuine belief that the music is really what counts, not any kind of image mongering. But they've al already been horribly messed about by the NME on one occasion. Um, and uh, it's a difficult kind of game to play, and in a certain way it is a game that they're playing. But it's, I think it's based on very genuine motivation. Um, I 
just fear for the kind of long-term relationship with the media. It's kind of worked in our favour at times, not doing an awful lot, but it's good to do them as well, you know, but I think it's only going to be when records come out that we'll do certain interviews, but in between records we probably won't. I think we'll probably calm down quite a bit in the old media front in the next one, not that we've been like anything to calm down from. But <laughs> Is it wicked not to care when they say that you're mistaken thinking hopes is not of dreams that aren't there? Is it wicked not to care when you've wasted many hours talking endlessly to anyone that's there? I know the truth awaits me. Skipping tickets, making rhymes Is that all that you believe in? Wearing rags to make you pretty by design Rusting armor for effect It's not fun to watch the rust grow For it will all be over when you're dead keeps working and the albums keep coming. I think the time that um, it really hit me that the band were affecting people was when we played uh, the Union Chapel in London and um, it was just about to come up to the, the instrumental and everyone, a thousand people in the church just stood up simultaneously and started dancing about and it was just a totally amazing experience. And, um, I was looking at the rest of the band and they were just, just couldn't believe what was happening. And uh, we were just like smiling at each other, just grinning at each other. And it, was, it, was, it was an incredible moment. After recording loads of LPs and singles and doing their own thing, the band is nominated for an important music industry award. Richard and Mick go down to London for the ceremony. It's Stevie Wonder and Muhammad Ali. And the award for the best newcomer goes to... Bell and Sebastian. Gosh, it's us. Back home, the rest of the band are watching the award ceremony on telly. Bell and Sebastian, a band that actually formed in an all-night cafe in Glasgow. Now, the band began working together as part of a government uh, training scheme, and their third album, they're already on that one, The Boy with the Arab Strap, that reached number one in the indie charts. Hooray! Hi, this is Bell. I'm Sebastian. Uh... Well, we are tonight. I suppose the studio, this but, um, means we've really well, made I don't it. Know if this is meant to happen or not, but uh, thanks to Jeepster who are sitting in the corner and uh, bizarre night. Thanks a lot. Richard and myself were just doing it for the laugh. We, we, we were there for the crack, and um, it was a really bizarre time. You know, it's the strangest 24 hours of my life. I remember walking down the, you know, down the road to the actual uh, ceremony itself. And, and getting to the front and, and you know, the, the big doors and, and right opposite from that there was a huge barrier with tons and tons of teenage girls and stuff all yeah, screaming at everybody. Uh, and on the left hand side there was a huge bank of photographers, maybe a hundred photographers and every time somebody actually, you know, walked in, shh, click, 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 flash, flash, flash. But when we walked in, silence and no flashes at all. Yeah. So it, it was, um, yeah, no, nobody had a clue who we were, and, and even when we won it, still had anyone to clue who we were. When it was actually announced, Best Newcomers, Bell and Sebastian, you could see 98% of the people in that hall who professed to work in the music business going, Bell and what? What, who? Who? Is anybody, what? I don't know, they're a double act, perhaps they're like Robson and Jerome, Bell and Sebastian, you know, I don't know. The only atmosphere comes from, from the kids down the front, there's like about 500 kids in a, in a kind of pit down the front and they're sort of cheering and clapping and stuff most of the time, but when we won the awards, uh, I think most of them were crying because uh, their, their idols, um, Steps and Billy, didn't win it. 
So two of them get up on stage there, and there's Richard wearing uh, this kind of uh, man at CNA safari suit, you know, and Mick, and they just sort of fumbled about up there, and, and, and everybody's thinking, what, you know, is this some kind of elaborate joke, you know? Are they, is, is, is kind of, you know, Ben Elton going to come on and shove them out of the way, and then steps are going to come and pick up the prize, you know? And it, it was a great moment, actually. It was a truly great moment. And then to be on the front cover of The Sun the following weekend, it was just utter insanity. Um, Stuart Murdoch phoned me up and said, oh, have you seen the front cover of The Sun? You won't believe it, you won't believe it. And, you know, right enough, I didn't, I didn't believe it at all. It's just crazy. People say, though, there was an organised block vote. Well, of course, you know, I mean, the fans vote. If the band were in any way instrumental and involved in the Machiavellian plot to motivate the fans and mobilise this uh, Great Bell and Sebastian vote, well, fair play to them, you know. Um, I mean, and Pete Waterman, because Steps didn't win, uh, you know, uh, took his ball home and his bottom lip was going. You know, but I mean, for a marketing man of his uh, self-professed genius, not to think of doing the same, showed him up, I think. You know, he's just probably a bit hacked off that he hadn't thought of doing the same thing. A friend of mine actually did a test with a, a cabbie in Glasgow. He did the cabbie test. He said uh, to this, this taxi driver just after the Sun headline, uh, do you know who Bell Sebastian are? And the, ta the taxi driver goes, aye, that's the crowd that cheated at the Brits. So, so that's, that says it all, really, you know. We went from being nobodies to household names in in the space of three days, and all I'd done on those three days was go to the pub, go down the studio and go and watch Celtic. But does this mean the band will change? Next day, the band are rehearsing in their flat. We've got to get this song right before our gig at the RAF club tomorrow night. Tea, anybody? Thank goodness. Success hasn't changed us at all. Most pop now is just disposable mints with no idea beyond making cash registers ring, whereas uh, Bell and Sebastian are about making your heart sing. Do you get the impression sometimes that hated by some people and liked by other people, I suppose. I think what Bell Sebastian do is, um, you know, it's good, it's good songs, good tunes. There's not much more to it than that. The songs are probably a lot more melodic than, than most uh, kind of mainstream pop songs that are around just now. That's all I can think of, though, I don't... I'm not a fan. They are things that you should really um, object to. This sort of musical fundamentalist, pre-dance music, you know, churchgoers. But you just find yourself liking them.